All right, I'm Jim Mundorf. This is Lonesome Lands Podcast. And today I'm with Amanda Radke. And she has been, you can't tell by looking at her, but she has been fighting for cattlemen and, and independent landowners for a long time. And I, I always, I just told her I hate starting these things because I don't ever have a good way of introducing people. But um, when I started this deal, it was like, I suppose it was around five years ago. The first thing I wrote that anybody really paid any attention to was about lab meat and the fake lab meat. And I would write in, and over the years, I always kind of overgeneralize ag media. You know, I talk about how bad they are. But back then I was looking up ag, you know, this lab meat and no one in ag media was, I would say this, no one in ag media is talking about how Tyson and Cargill, the two biggest beef processors have, um, have invested in this lab meat, but I couldn't say that because Amanda Radke was the one person who was working in <laughs> ag media at the time who would talk about, um, who talked about those investments. So, um, here we are. So Amanda, where are you from exactly? Yeah, I'm from Mitchell, South Dakota, Southeast corner of South Dakota. My uh, family runs Radke land and cattle and Angus seed stock operation there. And yeah, I guess I've worked in ag media for close to 20 years now, but hopefully I'm the exception to the rule and I I write the truth no matter the consequences. Yeah, and you're a little more independent now, right? Because back then you were working for Beef Magazine. Correct. Yep. And you and wrote a blog. Yes, Beef them. Daily wrote that for 13 years, four blogs a week. Um, and it, it, it did give me a national platform to talk about issues, uh, but it got to the point where it was time to part ways. And so now I'm independently running my own media. I, I have a, a podcast, The Heart of Rural America, that comes out every Wednesday. And then I have a column that's syndicated, goes out to different publications across the country called The Radke Report. And I'm very careful with the sponsors I align myself with or the people that kind of come into the fold because I never want to be told what to write and how to write and what to say. So it's, it's been very freeing. Yeah. And so now I can say all of ag media stinks because you're not part of it. (laughs) Well, when one publication is getting $40 million to write about sustainability, I would say, yeah, it's not, doesn't just stink. It's state run media. So, well, I have, (laughs) you know, here in front of me, I have, uh, and I'm, an article that of the about the issue we're going to talk about from Progressive Farmer. So they're the other one. I think really when I talk about ag media, I would say it's Progressive Farmer and um, Farm Journal. But because I've you I know told what the, the great people, thing is though with social media now and independent reporters like such as yourself, you're one of the top notch investigative reporters I would say in in ag media world anymore. And I know neither you wouldn't even consider yourself in ag media, but the fact that individual voices that are willing to speak up and share the truth uh, can be amplified through independent podcasts or the work that they post on social media. Um, I think it's a great thing. And I would encourage other people to get in the arena and, and start singing the truth from the rooftops because the truth is on our side. And that's, that's the best part of it. Yeah. And South Dakota seems like the place for it. Cause I, I, t- I was talking to a tri-state livestock they're another ag media that is i'm like i don't don't put yourself in when i say anything about yeah, ag media right but there's well, some, some smaller local enough, tri-state livestock news was the first publication to give me my start in college so i i yeah. freelanced for them for many many years and yeah they are top-notch investigative journalists as well yeah and they're yeah so there's a number of, of good local ones mm-hmm. and i wanted to see also say i've never i've talked to you multiple times but i've never brought this up um when you were starting out it had to be like 15 years ago or so mm-hmm. you um hosted a cattle dog uh national cattle dog association finals yeah you remember that i do um and the trophy do you, you know i work with longhorns and build stuff out of longhorns well i gather that yes oh well the trophy <laughs> behind you had longhorns all over it because my brother i think at the time was the president of the cattle dog uh national stock dog or i don't know national cattle dog association that's what it is national cattle dog association um and he had me build this trophy and so there's a picture of you 15 years ago holding this trophy that i made um somewhere i have it somewhere i know the exact picture and i'm going to text it to you after (laughs) after we get oh good good then i don't have to look for it 
like career, my career in agriculture started out in such a humbling way. That one, I, I'll never forget because it was televised. I think it was on RFD or some yeah. big channel. Um, but I had to get ready for the TV shoots, like in a porter potty using a little tiny mirror. Boys don't have this problem, but this was a real stressful thing for a girl. And it was like 90 degree weather trying to get ready in a porter potty. So, uh, yep, you got to get the job done no matter what the elements are. All right. Well, that's a good introdu introduction, I think, to, to how <laughs> you think operate. So. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so so I wanted you on today to talk about what's going on in South Dakota. Why is there a pipeline going across South Dakota? And like, what is the end goal? Like, where is it going? Where is what's the end goal with this carbon? Where is the carbon going and why does it have to go across South Dakota? Sure. Uh, so this pipeline would be a multi-state project. Uh, there is the $1 billion uh, GEVO that's going to create sustainable aviation jet fuel that'll be put up in Lake Preston, South Dakota, that, that will be using in or tying into this project, as well as I think it's up to 57 different ethanol plants. Uh, what has been argued is there are other avenues or pathways to this carbon project. You can bury it next to the ethanol plants and sequester it there. Uh, and truck it. Um, there's other products that you can make to participate in these global markets, but it's all tying into incentives that are coming out of California. So this is a California driven initiative to lower the CI score of this corn in order to play in this national and global market. But what these folks don't understand is the people creating the, the arbitrary measures for these CI scores they can change those metrics at ever any time. You're not going to be green enough for people who truly see sustainability as a way to seize control of your land. Um, and, and so that word has been hijacked and weaponized against the very producers who are a sustainability success story. Uh, but yeah, the devil's in the details and all these things. And I, that's what's been really frustrating is it's divided the Republican Party in South Dakota. It's divided farmers and ranchers in South Dakota. I mean, you have neighbors that have lived next to each other peacefully for 130 years since statehood began that are now enemies. Because one side's saying like, hey, I've worked really hard for this land and I don't personally want to participate in this carbon capture climate hoax garbage. And the other guy's saying, well, I want to. And the only way that I get to play in this market is if I take your land and take what's yours. Uh, so there's this mob rule mentality. Um, even our Farm Bureau here has came out with uh, statements or their their uh, general um, policy that they're okay with if 66% Two thirds sign up. They're okay with mob rule over the last third. Um, so it's very alarming to me the commitment that exists in our agricultural industry to get this project no matter what. And we've always just argued that you can do your project, but don't do it by stepping on your neighbor's throat. Don't do it by taking away private property rights. Don't do it by giving up local control. Do the project honestly with participating landowners. And we'll probably go away. We'll go home and mind our own business and calve out our cows and live peacefully. But right now, <laughs> that's just not the case of what's happening in South Dakota, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. all this talk, like I've retweeted, and it's SB 201, South Dakota State Bill 201. Can you just lay it out, like what, what it is? Yeah. Well, to kind of set the stage, I think it's important for people to know how South Dakota has operated in the last four years. Uh, when COVID hit, uh, we stayed open, unlike many other states. And the directive coming from the governor's office and trickling down was, we trust the people. We'll keep our communities open. Local local decision makers can guide and lead their communities on what, see, what is the best course of action during this pandemic. And it largely saved our state and many of the businesses uh, that still exist today because governments weren't dictating to them how to live. And so fast forward to now, and it seems like this climate change agenda is like COVID 2.0, but on steroids. It is um, basically, no matter what, these big corporations that are sponsoring politicians are saying, we need to get these projects through. We are in a hurry to get these projects through because there's 45 Q tax credits that will pay us immensely if we get these projects through. And so SB 201, the reason that there is such a huge outcry on it is it is essentially 
being written for one foreign-backed, out-of-state, privately-owned carbon capture pipeline company to come in and to change not only the rules of the game, but just to change the game altogether and to defy 130 years of, of precedent in our state since our state was created to make sure that there is local control, that communities get to drive decisions. And so SB 201 essentially strips local control, centralizes it and socializes it with the, the thumb of a big brother nanny state so that when projects like this come in, the counties have no ability to do setbacks or ordinances or map out the project route. It's just going to be dictated by the state. And that's what's really troubling is that taking of that local control. Yeah. And so what it really does is just takes away. So it it, it takes all those decisions to the Capitol, really. Correct. Like the Correct. whole like the counties have no say over this anymore is what right. SB 201 says is your counties don't matter. Your county supervisors your local elections really don't matter. Right. It right. all goes to the to the state, which mm -hmm. is where it's much easier for the lobbyists just to sit around one building and work right. instead of go to every county. Right. Well, and people don't realize this one company has sued over 160 individual landowners as well as individual counties over these ordinances. And so the pro the proponents of this bill are saying it provides uniformity, it provides clarity, it 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 shows that we're open for business in South Dakota that that we're easy to work with, but and 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 then they also say, well, the federal government is going to come down on us anyway. And I I mean, my thought is like, when on earth, where on earth does it make sense to strip away local authority in order to save it? And that's what they're trying to do. But they're just trying to grease the wheel for one company uh, so that they don't have they can skip all the lawsuits. But the private landowners in this state are saying absolutely not. The buck stops at home uh, with private property rights and local government control. That's the tenant of freedom in America in this country. And why are we changing the rules for one corporation? Um, and that that's really, really the challenging and struggling part of all of this. Yeah. And one thing you said stuck out to me when you're talking about ordinances, that doesn't even mean it's, it's not even saying that you can't have the pipeline. It's, you know, just kind of setting up some rules of how they have to do it. And right. they're against that too, right? You right. said there's lawsuits against certain ordinances. Correct. Yeah, and it yeah. and it it's not like it's not like it's just a a utility where there's a public use, like a water or electric or something like this. There is absolutely no public benefit. There's nobody in South Dakota that's going to be using carbon that's designed to be permanently sequestered. And so this is really it's it's politicians choosing corporations and industry over the good of the people. And I always say, yeah, in South Dakota, we say that we're the freest state, state in the nation, that we're open for business. And those things are true. But in order for those things to be really true, we have to protect and preserve the constitution. And if we do those things, then people can thrive, businesses can thrive. And guess what? The private sector is an even better place to operate than having your hand out and waiting for a, a tax subsidy or credit that frankly, could be done and over with when the next new big thing comes along. So I, I've actually, I've, I've been shocked. Um, I've been on the opposite side of this with big leaders in this state, agriculture leaders, uh, agricultural associations, uh, folks that are invested in ethanol. And I've said, I am, I am a huge champion for agriculture. There is nothing I want more than farmers and ranchers to be successful and industries to thrive and all of those things. But what's been shocking to me is these individuals have said point blank to me, Amanda, we know the science is bogus. We know this carbon capture thing is a hoax. We know that it's not going to change the environment or save the planet, but there's money to be had. There's markets to be gained. And so they are really willing to trade principle for cash and to build a business on the premise of a lie and to do it using our taxpayer dollars. It is a slap in the face and it's been it's been a wake up call um, here in the state of South Dakota, that's for sure. I think to back about like how how do we kind of get here to the to this point like when this first started coming along like the first I heard about it was like seeing the armed security guards showing up at people's houses kind of unannounced and people who had from what I read had been you know friendly and and not to really standoffish they may have just said you know we don't want you on our property 
um, mm-hmm. and then they all of a sudden show up with armed security guards. But was there a lot going on before that? Or Yeah. So there, at that time, there were two carbon pipeline companies, Summit Carbon Solutions and Navigator, that were going across the state, getting people to sign up easements. I truly believe a lot of the people that signed up for these e- easements did it under the impression of of threats and coercions and lies. Uh, One of their most famous lie is saying, well, all of your neighbors have signed up, so you're the last one. Well, that's not true. In counties like McPherson and Brown, they have 28% signups. And and in other counties, uh, they claim, you know, like, oh, in this county, we have a 100% signup. Well, in that county, it's really disingenuous. It's four miles of land and three landowners. And so you have a huge swath of people that are saying, no, thank you. At one point, I know uh, there was there was offers on the table from from Navigator for twenty thousand five hundred dollars an acre. They would show up with banana bread and a new offer every week. And the landowners were all laughing and saying, like, you know, no, thank you. It doesn't matter what the price is because there's things worth more in life than money. Um, Summit, on the other hand, had sheriffs backing them. They would show up with armed security. They would walk through your shops and your buildings and your yards. Uh, One gentleman, they had tore up all his crops. They left huge ruts. They had opened up multiple feedlot gates. And they were just, I mean, basically imagine you're running your business. It's on your land that you pay for and you pay taxes on. And you've got like an armed corporation running around your yard, your wife and kids are crying in the house and you don't know what to do and you have no recourse. Um, I got involved in this battle because for two years, I just kind of sat observing and really studying it. I don't, I'm not, I'm not really a naturally confrontational person. I, I really like to gather information, pray on it, listen to stories, and then, then I'll take action when I see something that needs to be addressed. Um, So I'm not just picking on this just because it's the thing to do right now. I've really sat and studied this and I couldn't deny the challenge when I got, I mean, I can't even tell you how many phone calls I got uh, from little old widows. There was one woman I met, uh, she had 10 acres to her name. Her husband had passed. They had raised their kids on this land for 50 years. This was all she has in her life. And this company came up to her and said, you either sign this easement or we're just going to use eminent domain anyway, and we'll put this carbon pipeline wherever we want. I had another family, they, they bought a chunk of land with the intention of building a new house so that they're on that spot so that their kids could come home, live on the original farmhouse and ranch alongside of them. And that carbon pipeline is going to go right through the property that they had spent 30 years paying on and dreaming about. And so that's why I always say, do your pipeline. If you want to bury carbon I mean, I think you're a weirdo. I think you're doing things that are not based on reality or the truth, but go do it in your backyard. I don't really care. But what I do care about is a mob rule mentality where one way or another, we are putting this pipeline in your backyard, whether you like it or not. And uh, so to me, it's it's uh, like if we don't have private property rights in the state of South Dakota, we cannot say we are the freest state in the nation. Um, South Dakota has fallen. And when I look at my neighbors right to the east of me, Minnesota, and they just put in 200 some miles of pipeline exactly like this, and they did it without eminent domain because a blue state like Minnesota has better protections than we do. And they simply zigzagged their routes and worked with participating landowners that wanted to be a part of the project. If Minnesota can do it, but South Dakota can't do it without stripping private property rights, we have a huge, huge problem in this state. And And one of the things I said in my testimony against this bill, which, by the way, when I testified on it, it was in committee. It was nine legislators up on a big desk and we got up and the room was packed. And one of the things I said during my testimony was there are only four states that have uh, bills or laws in place like this SB 201. Do you want to know what states they are? It's California, Michigan, New York and Illinois. And my challenge that day was, I don't know what you guys are going to do here, but even if you do pass it, and even if it gets through the Senate and the House, there is absolutely no way our freedom-loving governor who believes in personal responsibility and being running businesses and building communities and all of these great things that we hold dear in South Dakota, there's absolutely no way Governor Kristi Noem could sign this piece of legislation and be the fifth governor on a list of blue states like New York, California, Michigan, and Illinois. There's right. no possible way. 
Yeah, so now okay. it's going to come to a head this week and we will see what happens. Right. Um, yeah, that's, you, you talked about them. And, and so in my County, there's a, uh, there's a big push for windmills and they did the, you know, a lot of the things you were saying, at least the thing where they come around and they say, well, everyone else has already signed up. Mm-hmm. That has been like, that's just common knowledge. And in, in counties where these windmill people come through right. or these, you know, these big corporations, it's just weird how they operate. Cause it's almost like the opposite of how I think you or I would do things if we right. wanted to get something done. Right. It's almost like, and to come in, like you said, they're going into people's shops, like, and this is before anything signed. They have absolutely no legal authority to do that, right? Like, right. it's just no, like no permit. Which, by the way, Navigator was denied their permit. They are no longer putting setting up shop here in South Dakota. And so I have people tell me all this time, like, you're on the losing side of this, this big business, all this money coming, all the politicians are blocked in. It, you're not going to win. And I say. Well, we already went through the process and the process works great. And Navigator, unfortunately, did not meet the qualifications that the Public Utilities Commission laid out for them based on the South Dakota way. And they packed up and went home. Um, Now, I'm not saying I'm anti-pipeline. And people ask me that, like, oh, you're just against this project. I said, no, what I'm against is private companies going on private land and trying to take what's not theirs. And this piece of legislation, should it pass, will set such a dangerous precedent that open for business in South Dakota now looks like a threat. What it really means is our land is for sale to the highest bidder and you don't have a choice. And so we have hydrogen, solar, wind, all of these projects waiting in the wings that they just can't wait because they know it'll be open season on our land here and we'll have no recourse for saying, no, I don't want to do this project. And I think looking from other states too, I think it'll set a precedent when, cause you, you know, that those companies are sitting there like, well, here, what's the game plan going forward? And, and if South, De- and it, then they'll see South Dakota opens up and then mm-hmm. they have a game plan. You know what right. I mean? Like mm-hmm. th- then we can add more states to that very blue list, you know, that you just listed. And- um, And so really the hopes of the hopes of rural America almost are sitting on South Dakota. Like, um, you know, to, really? to fight well, and this that, thing off. It, and it's really, it's a matter of days. I mean, by Friday, we will know how this shakes loose. And I have asked Governor Christy Nome for that strong leadership. I've said, cowgirls don't sit on the fence. We get off the fence. We choose a side. We see a problem and we square up to it and we fix it. And, and so for three years, she's been rather quiet on it. She has said, you know, I stand with landowners and yet she has such an influential voice on a national scale. If she went out and publicly said, we will not bend to climate change tyranny in South Dakota, we will not become a corporate oligarchy in South Dakota, the leadership in other states would follow. And unfortunately, we see a land grab happening in Kansas with like, I think it's called like Sunflower or something, but it's for thousands of acres of land for solar. In in uh, Wyoming, uh, look up Project Bison. It's going to be one of the largest carbon capture projects in the United States. And these are supposedly, you know, conservatives, middle, you know, flyover state country and, and rural the United States. And uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a tyranny we have never known. And I, I always say in my speeches to people, there's two things I tell people and I speak all across the country and it doesn't matter if it's, I mean, on all sides of the aisle in agriculture, people always want to pin me down as I'm, I'm loyal to one organization or another. Like I go where I'm invited. And when I speak there, I tell the truth. Um, but two things I tell producers, because all of this gets really heavy sometimes and you feel like it's just coming down on us. There's no recourse. And I always tell them two things. Number one, your private property rights are paramount. The devil is in the details on some of these deals and these easements and these projects and these incentives you're signing up for. And and when you allow access onto your land of someone you cannot control, that they can sell that easement, they can mortgage it off, they can trade it, they could go bankrupt, all these things. If you do not control your land, what else do you have? So I tell people, be very careful there and don't do business with people that hate you and want you off the land. And well, no matter how green you are, you'll never be sustainable enough. It's the same with animal rights activists. They have the exact same mentality. No matter how many hoops you jump through, no matter how much compromising you do, at the end of the day, these people don't want you to have cattle. 
They don't want you to manage them as you see fit. They want to control you and put you out of business. So I tell people, be very careful about the people you associate with and do business with. And the other side of things I tell people is that the buck stops at the local government, that I can't control what's happening in DC or at a state level, but I can be on my township or county commissioners or school boards. And if, if things are done properly and we do protect our constitution, you can make big change on a local level. But if all that gets stripped away, I'm not sure what to tell producers to do next. I'm really not. Right. And that's, I feel like, yeah, that goes back to like all eyes are on you. And I, you know, I talk about all rural America's watching South Dakota and see what they do. But I think all these other governors, like you listed those other states. And I know Texas has a big push for solar too. Yep. Um, and I'm sure all those other governors are probably watching too, wondering, you know, what the reaction will be or, or, you know, for or against. And I guess, Maybe that you said it's going to be done this week, right? It is. Um, so today, as we speak, just to kind of give people a little timeline today, uh, it is in a, a like a shared committee. Uh, uh, it's behind closed doors. There's three representatives from the House and from the Senate. So it's six people in a closed door session. And at this point, they can edit the bill. They could take out big chunks. They can add more things in. They could put the emergency clause back in, which would mean it would be the second it was signed, it would be effective into law and there could never be a referendum by the voting public. Uh, so this bill could be even worse than we could ever imagine based on what happens today. But then what will happen, unless it gets killed today and they can't come to a conclusion and it dies today, which I highly doubt, it will come out of that shared committee and it will go to the House and Senate floors tomorrow. And then we have the opportunity for our legislator a bo legislative body to vote yes or no. If they approve it and if it if they vote it through, it will land on the governor's desk sometime later this week. And that will be the day that she has to say, I stand with the landowners or I'm siding with the big corporations and the big industries. And so it's, yeah, it's kind of a do or die time right now. This is a really pressing time. And I encourage people to pick up the phone, send the emails, put the pressure on, there's still an opportunity for our elected officials to do the right thing, but though we're coming down to the wire here. Right. And have you thought about like, if it succeed, like if this bill passes, then what? Yeah, I've, I've thought about it a lot. <laughs> I mean, you have to, right? <laughs> I mean, this is a, uh... I mean, this is a grassroots effort on our side. It is landowners, families, business people. I mean, people from all walks of life, from the left and the right side of the aisle. I mean, all these people are coming together saying this cannot go through. In fact, we had a petition that went out and within 24 hours, we had over 2000 signatures from South Dakotans in all 66 counties of the state saying, please do not take away our local control. Please do not do this because every single person, whether they're in the line of that pipeline or they're all the way West River running cattle, they know if this goes through, we will not have control of our land. We will not have control of our communities and who knows what will happen next. Right. And I think on the flip side, it's good to note, I mean, that we're going up, this is truly a David and Goliath moment. I mean, we're going against some of the biggest and highly funded lobbyists in the nation. I mean, these are big suits. Uh, it's a known fact that they are uh, donating to different campaigns of various politicians within the leadership uh, and our legislative body. And it shows, it shows in how they're voting, it shows in how they're acting. And uh, it's very rare that there's a farmer or rancher testifying on the other side, even though the big associations and the big industry are saying we're all for it. The reality is South Dakotans don't want to step on their neighbors to be successful. They don't want to slit the throat of somebody else in order to advance their financial position. It's not the South Dakota way. Um, so even though we're kind of the little dog in this fight or the underdog in this fight, I've never been more proud to stand on the side of patriotism and Americanism, American, you know, freedom and liberty, private property rights, the constitution, it's all there. And on the other side, the only thing I hear is money. We can make money. And to me- right. I'm on the right side of history here and I sleep like a baby at night knowing that. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then that goes back. Like I said, I have this article from progressive farmer and it really, it, it kind of just wraps up like kind of the arrogance and condescending nature of the people. I mean, this is the summit CEO. Um, this is the, the article is called summit CEO CO2 pipeline time is now. 
and he talks about you as as a very loud minority and the people against this pipeline. He calls them a very loud minority. Yeah. Well, and that goes back to how they've treated landowners um, too, and they and they've really kind of t- tried to control the narrative in the mm-hmm. whole thing. It seems like. Um, Well, to kind of highlight how we're not a vocal minority just causing problems, there was a rally last summer. There were 700 people in attendance at this capital rally talking about we have to protect private property rights. Um, On January 8th, I've just been in the thick of this all of 2024, but on January 8th, we had a private property rights rally uh, in the middle of a blizzard where people couldn't even drive and we still had 300 people there. And the, the, the main thing that we've asked for, it's been very clear, we're not anti-ethanol, we're not anti-corn producer. Mo- many of these people are invested in the ethanol companies and they are corn farmers. But what we're asking for is three things. We're asking for maintain our private property rights, preserve the constitution and protect our private property rights. Number two, we're asking to maintain local government control. Don't take away our ability to lead in our communities. And number three, we're asking for no eminent domain for private gain. And I think people don't understand there were a dozen bills introduced in this legislative session, and some of them would have provided some real protections to landowners and really would have safeguarded our Constitution. Those were all quickly killed. And the last three that remain have been promoted by the leadership on the Senate and House side of the Republican Party, and they've been promoted as uh, the biggest landowner uh wins and victories in 30 years and they're anything but because all they do in these packages they're just trying to give us some kernels of corn right like it's like oh if 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 a company comes on your land we'll give you $500 well if i say no thank you and you don't have a permit like that's just legalizing trespassing to me it's saying here's $500 whether you own 5 acres or 10 sections of land now that we gave you this $500 we can do what we want with it and then the state itself they're not in the business of negotiating contracts. They're literally writing into these bills like, well, you'll get a dollar, you know, an acre uh, if you're on the path line or you'll get this little incentive or that. Um, Last I checked that business dealings are meant to be done between private parties, not the government. And Summit Carbon Solutions has even said in their testimony, you can put that in the bill, but a lot of these easements have already been signed. And by law, we're not required to do this and give this dollar a foot or whatever it is. And so it's like, it's lip service. It does nothing. And another thing our politicians keep saying is it gives us private property rights. Well, excuse me, our private property rights are God-given. They are inherent. They are protected by the constitution. They are not yours to give or take away at all. And so it's very interesting to me to see, I don't know, it's like, I need to send the these politicians a copy of the constitution or something they they fell asleep in social studies class and they've forgotten the basic reason and role of the government which is to make a fair playing field and then get out of the way and let the private industry you know be entrepreneurs and build businesses right and that's for those not real familiar the main problem with this is that it is a public company like the reason eminent domain gets to be used is because it provides a public service um and and not like private gain like this is for private um this is a private company for private profits you know and when you get into these numbers this obviously is the way they're pushing this and how hard they are fighting this obviously is going to be very profitable for them um and you know i want hopefully the landowners can see that too right i mean land you know i mean it it goes back to you know these even the, like these power companies and stuff that put up telephone, you know, power lines mm-hmm. and different things like that. Well, how much are they actually making off of your property? You know, in the end, the property owner gets the shaft every time in these kind of deals because they're not going to get. And and when they sign these easements and these deals, a lot of times they're in perpetuity, and you know, it, nothing ever changes. Um, and it, it's just kind of ridiculous, but. So go back. I talked about. I asked you what would happen if that bill went through. Um, and what happens next if it fails? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I imagine I mean, 
It's up so to Summit. So Summit, Car Summit Carbon Solutions needs to reapply for their permit. Uh, so I imagine they have expressed that they will reapply. It would sure be a lot easier for them if this if this legislation went through. The wheels would be greased and it would go a lot differently. Um, essentially, uh, this bill takes away power from the Public Util Utilities Commission too. And what's going to happen when the public PUC steps in and, and says... Um, it, you know, oh, this local county made too strong of an ordinance, so we're going to override it. Well, that's going to end up in court. And then instead of having an elected body like the PUC make a decision on a permit, it's going to be a judge and a judge that, you know, could have other interests, doesn't understand the issue. And so, yeah, the people can't even can't even rely on elections to make sure the PUC is is representing the best interests of the people and the communities because it circumvents that. Um, so yeah, there'll, there'll be another application process. Summit will reapply, I imagine. Uh, a lot of this is linked. There's a, a billion dollar company called Jevo that would make sustainable jet aviation fuel in Lake Preston, South Dakota. Uh, they have said multiple times in testimonies that if South Dakota is hostile for business, they will pack up and take their billion dollar company somewhere else. Uh, so I think there's a lot of money riding on this. There's a lot of pride and ego from our legislative body and our politicians that they want to be able to say we brought the first billion dollar company to South Dakota. Um, but at the end of the day, none of this would be happening without federal tax dollars. And so we really have to ask ourselves, we have what, $33 trillion in debt. And the more money we take from the federal government, it's just adding to that and, and we'll be dead, but it'll be our kids and our grandkids that are carrying this burden and if there were no tax dollars or any tax credits attached to this, none of these businesses would be happening at all. And so we have to ask ourselves, you know, what's the rush? Is there an expiration date on these dollars? What's the rush? If the 2024 election turns out in a different way, does the money run dry? Does the well run dry? And so that's why I think they're in a big, big hurry because there's money to be made. It's like the gold rush of the Wild West days, right? Everyone's out to get that, that golden nugget. But in this case, this golden nugget is based on a red hot lie and that right. the climate needs to be changed and that carbon is the enemy. But yeah, and that's, is yeah, that's the gold rush is is the the government like these companies see the the easiest and most profitable way to do business is government contracts. And and we Public could go into partnerships, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's we go back to the last podcast. Um, yep. And that's the other thing, too, like there's no transparency in that at all. Mm -hmm. um we don't know you know who they talk about public private partnerships and they have essentially made that legal but they don't there's they're not telling us well who is in on the partnership like how much are they paying and how right. much are they getting back you know what i mean um well, how is it appropriate for the government to pick winners and losers in business when did we get off the rails that way and think this is the way we operate in america do you know who operated this way Hitler, he loved public-private partnerships. One of the first things he did when he took control, aside from taking away the guns, was to heavily subsidize the farmers to placate them, to get them kind of on his side. And then he ripped the rug out from underneath them and he seized private property. So essentially, he controlled the entire food system. And I always say in my speeches, he who controls the land controls the food and who controls the food controls the people. Now, the great thing that American farmers and ranchers need to realize is right now, today, we own the land. We have control of the land. We have leverage. We have the food people want. We raise the beef that everywhere around the world is hungry for. When are we going to stop giving away our leverage? When are we going to realize our power in the marketplace? When we do that, we will be great. But if we continue to sit down and compromise with people who simply want to seize control of our assets and, and monetize those assets on the backs of our hard labor, we'll lose. And that's that's the kind of the tip of the spear. That's the the two paths we have. And but I I'm I've put all my money on the American cattle rancher. I believe they're the last beacon of freedom. And uh, the people I've met on this journey they're not going to give up laying down. There's too right. much, there's too much American patriotism in their blood to ever, ever bend a knee to this tyranny. Yeah. And when I uh, guys, I was thinking about that when you were talking about the numbers showing up 
at these rallies. And I, like you said, 700, 300, that might not sound like a ton of people, but when you get into agriculture and these people who are raising cattle and have real responsibilities that their operation relies on every single day, seven days a week, um, that's a big number, you know, getting people, it, it's not easy to get those people out and, and, you know, spend the day driving and, and, you know, fighting for their rights. It's, it's, yep. and it's I impressive. think about that a lot for these lobbyists. It's just another day in the office, right. but the people I'm all sitting by, they're calving cows. It's winter. We've got waters to check, you know, scoop, snow to scoop. Like the reality is, is it's life and death out here on the range. It's a huge financial burden to drive the three hours to get to pier and sit there all day. And then to be slapped in the face by these legislators that aren't listening to you, no matter how much you plead and cry and share your story. And in fact, they've, they've told me, they've told me multiple times, but they kind of tell the whole group, like your side is emotional. I see a lot of emotion. It's not emotion. It is passion. It is right. purpose. It is patriotism. And we wouldn't be where we are today on the land. If we didn't have those things, you can't be a cattle rancher without passion and purpose and patriotism and understanding this legacy you're trying to build. Yeah. Uh, so I guess they just want us to be robots like the paid lobbyists. But that's yeah, that's what I was going to say. They probably think you're emotional because the other side has no emotion. You know right. what I mean? They have it's no real, <laughs> it's their job, you know? Yep. Yep. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, you've, you've mentioned foreign owned a lot. Um, can you go into that some like summit or foreign yep. backed? Yeah. So it's interesting because for three years, the people have asked, who are your investors? Who is behind this? They have over 500 investors that have not been disclosed. I think we know of maybe a dozen, um, but one goes back to South Korea. You know, right now we have legislation that's being pushed by Governor Kristi Noem. It's, it's gone through it, it, its claims to protect us from the foreign ownership of land in the state of South Dakota. And yet this company has foreign backing, Jivo has foreign backing, and uh, it's quite interesting to me that those actually don't apply. And it was asked during the session, okay, does this does this legislation that protects from foreign ownership, does it also apply to carbon pipelines? And uh, we kind of got brushed us to the side, like, right. oh, that's not, that's not the narrative. So that's not what we're going to focus on. Yeah. And one thing I've heard about in these easements when it comes to windmills, I've heard that they can be sold. Yes. Um, yeah. And so now I think there's a... I think it's Canadian company or uh, some foreign company that owns a lot of windmill easements on American property. So it's mm -hmm. like, and the one thing I'd want to, we keep talking about this and I keep thinking the main thing, if you ever get one of these easements or you're pressured on it, send it to a lawyer. I think there's a lot of people that sign these things without a lawyer seeing them. And because from what I've heard, a lot of times when a lawyer definitely looks at a first draft, he says, do not sign these things. Yeah. Um, but they because, come and they sit with their checkbook right on the dining room table. Right. Like, we can make the deal today. I can write you the check today. And they feel pressured or like, oh, the neighbors are going to look at me weird. The first thing I actually tell people to do, because there was a hydrogen project in South Dakota that was kind of coming up during all of this. And we had bull customers and their ranch that they've lived on for six generations was going to be flooded with the river and be 60 feet underwater should this hydrogen project go through. And they called me and they said, Amanda, what should we do? And I said, you should have an emergency landowner meeting. Everybody in the county get together. Everybody get on the same page because once one domino falls, it's like a ripple effect and people just fall. And then and then one, by the time people figure it out and a lot of people have signed the easements, it's like, OK, it's just a handful of guys left to fight. And I said, you got to keep people from letting the emotions or the, the threats or the manipulation get you to cave early. You need to assess. You need to study the project and know what you're signing up for. And so that's my encouragement is, again, the local community level uh, that that county wrote an ordinance uh, that would protect them from the bullying that's to come. Uh, that hydrogen project packed up and left, uh, but there'll be more. But mm -hmm. if we take away local control, which is what SB 201 uh, intends to do, that county trying to protect their ranches along the river We'll have no recourse and those ordinances mean nothing. Right. Yeah, that's that's really interesting the way that should work. But it, yeah, like you said, if that goes through, that'll never there will be no reason to even have local meetings because mm -hmm. it'll all get decided in the Capitol. 
Um, well, I probably sound like I'm anti progress or anti economic development or anti, you know, big agriculture. I'm really none of those things. Uh, but when I see the abuse of power and when I see these corporate oligarchies beginning to set up its shop on the backs of the individual citizen, that's where I have to kind of part ways and say, agriculture isn't successful if the very people working the land have no recourse or no ability to manage their land as they say fit. I mean, this will, it'll destroy the American dream. How can a person plan or prepare or build for the future knowing that someone could just take it at any minute? I mean, I can't think of anything more demoralizing as I look at my land on the prairie here in South Dakota, that it might not be mine. And I, I work my butt off, not for myself, but for my kids or grandkids. And if there's no certainty there, I mean, this is socialism, which will lead to communism. I mean, it's just, it's not the American way. Right. And if you look at, you, you look at those USDA numbers that came out like last week and the loss of small farmers and small ranchers, that we've had over these past 20 years. And then you think about who's the biggest farmland owner now in the country and it's Bill Gates. Um, and, you know, so I, in this article that summit talks about how this could add all this new income and all these plans, but you think about how these things have happened over the years and what is it really, what is it really done for first small, you know, these conservation right. plans, all these things, um, you know, grain prices have went crazy, but really, if you still look at at small town America, it's still kind of dying. Um, and and even the small independent producers are are being pushed out more and more. And yeah, you talk about a gold rush. Kill. What's oh, that? Go ahead. I was, I was just going to add, like, this will kill the family farmer. Absolutely, right. no in my mind. Go ahead. Yeah, and you you talk about a gold rush, and it, it does feel like that. All these corporations are, like you talked about that hydro plan, all these corporations are kind of looking at rural America, like how can we, you know, how can we get in there and get, and make money off of this? Um, and and I think this bill right here is, is kind of their solution. How can we get in there and make money off of rural America? Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Well, I, I believe it leads to that bigger picture of our food supply. I think we saw during COVID just kind of the crumbling of our infrastructure that we're not too big to fail. I mean, the fact that 85% of our beef supply is held captive by four major players, two of them that are foreign owned, one that's a known criminal in their foreign country. Uh, and what happens then when something like a global pandemic hits? I mean, during COVID, we had dairy farmers that were having to dump their milk because the plastic was stuck on ports somewhere. Uh, we had hog producers that, that were having to euthanize their hogs and pile them up because they couldn't go get them processed. At that time, my husband and I, we were we did a community butcher thing right in our garage just to make sure this pork wouldn't go to waste. I mean, and, and same in the beef industry. I mean, we are not too big to fail. And, and what I just started thinking of is what is the solution to it? To me, the farmer and rancher still had the food. We were still doing the work. It just couldn't get to the people we were trying to serve. The only way to save agriculture, to save rural America, to save the main streets and the schools and the churches in these little towns is to have as many families on the land as we possibly can so that we can have this robust, diverse food supply system that allows for many touch points to the people we aim to serve. And these initiatives, these public-private partnerships, this corporate oligarchy using federal tax dollars, it is going to absolutely crush the small and mid-sized family farmer and rancher. And then you're looking at just a few major players, and one day we'll all be JBS or Cargill farmers, and we won't own a, uh, one ounce of the land or the cattle. And it's not a future I want to be a part of. It right. really is. You keep mentioning this. You you mentioned your pra your prairie, and I I go back. You had a headline that said, "This is my prairie. Um, this is yeah. my home." Yeah. And that's like a Corb Lund song. Yeah. Right. Is that what you think? Well, I failed so, to credit Corb Lund in that, but I was uh, probably listening to that song while I wrote that column. Yeah. Yeah. So I was looking through the stuff you had written and posted last night, and then I was like, I'm gonna go back and watch that. There, like, there's a music video. This is yeah. my, and it's very like you watch it and it shows the backhoe coming in and digging up the dirt. And he's singing about, you know, the next line I think is, um, they can drill and they can mine my smoldering bones. Um, and then, and it kind of brings up thoughts of, and the, then he also has like, um, this is my rifle that my granddad owned, um, things like that. And it's kind of like, how hard are people going to push back? against that um and you hear people 
how desperate do you th- i mean you see what's going on in europe um and how those farmers have have really kind of lost all their rights and livelihood due to this climate change agenda how hard do you i mean and you feel like somebody with more kind of boots on the ground and, and has a feeling of of what people are thinking how hard do you think people will push back um if this goes through you know, I don't know if I've honestly been able to get myself there to think about it. It's it's devastating to think of the hopes and dreams and plans and legacies that will be destroyed through this. I mean, I, I don't even know if I can put it into words without crying, quite honestly. It is like the people I've met, their heart for this land and their families and their communities, I, I, it just runs so deep that... I mean, this is just such a departure from the American dream and the American way. Uh, But what I've told people and what I said on the rally that day, knowing that we were going against this giant, is these people don't know what they have awakened in the countryside here. They do not realize that a sleeping giant has been awoken um, and that these people value this far more than any dollar amount you could put on the table. Uh, So we have a real opportunity here in South Dakota this week to make a difference and to turn the tide on all of this agenda and say, not here, not in South Dakota, not to these people. That's what I want to think about. And I, I, I tell people it's not over till it's over and it's far from over. And so I want to give people hope and not thoughts of despair. I want to encourage people that their voice matters. That Yeah, you're one person. But you're joined by thousands and thousands of other people who think the very same thing. You know, this poster behind me says is the get in the arena. Um, and and it, it is it's you're going to get beat up. Um, it's going to be awful. But I would rather get beat up in the arena standing up for what is right than to be among those cold, timid souls that just accept the fate and say, well, the climate change agenda is here and we're going to just bend the knee to it. All right. So I wanted to say a big thank you to Amanda Radke for coming on here. And um, after listening through that, um, I think it's pretty obvious she's a really important voice for rural America. And a lot of times when these elections are political issues, when you're fighting for these things and they they don't always go your way, um, when you get done, you kind of think back about how you wish you would have done things different or you wish you would have thought fought harder. Um, I don't think that she will... Hopefully she won't think that because watching what she's doing and following her, it seems like she's really, she is fighting hard for the people of South Dakota and and she's really just leaving it all on the field. And so no no matter how this thing goes, I I think people of South Dakota should really be proud that, that they have her. And and she's doing a, she's really showing um, how important these independent voices are, not just for rural America, just, but for any media for America in general. And, and I thank her for that. Um, and so thanks everybody for listening and for watching and, um, we'll see you next time. Mic drop America.